In this video, I'm going to give a high-level description of how a single CPU executes instructions. The goal is not a thorough understanding of the details. Instead, I'm hoping to give you enough information to see why a software engineer needs to know about how the processor works. There are a lot of details that we can talk about later. In this video, I'm assuming that you've seen machine instructions. If not, you might want to watch the video at the top before you watch this one. A CPU essentially cycles through the fetch, decode, execute cycle. It fetches an instruction from memory. It decodes that instruction to figure out what needs to be done. It executes that instruction. And then it starts again, fetching the next instruction. There are two registers that are important for this cycle to work. Remember, registers are a set of special purpose storage locations that are inside the CPU. The program counter, or PC, holds the address of the next instruction, and the instruction register, IR, contains the instruction that we are currently working on. So the fetch part of this is essentially read the memory location the program counter points to and store that data into the instruction register. While this cycle is called the fetch decode execute cycle, there may also be one more piece, storing something back into memory. Because writing to memory takes a lot longer than, say, simple arithmetic, it can also be considered a separate part of the execute part of this cycle. This cycle is so innate to how the CPU behaves that the CPU actually has components related to it. The CPU has a control unit that does the decoding of the instruction and an arithmetic logic unit that does the execute. So the CPU is the part of the diagram above the line. The CPU has to talk with the RAM, or the memory, to store the information and to fetch the next instruction. This diagram shows the CPU structure that maps to the fetch decode execute cycle in more detail. The boxes in this diagram are the functional parts of the CPU, and the arrows show how data flows between them. At the highest level, you can see the fetch, decode, execute, and store parts of the cycle in this picture. Let's start by defining some of the blocks. Memory isn't really in the CPU. This is the circuitry that talks to the memory. The ALU is the arithmetic logic unit. That's the part of the CPU that actually does the calculations we need. The register file holds the registers that the CPU uses to hold the information that it's currently working with. So now, with this increase in detail, let's walk through it. The fetch part uses the address in the PC to fetch the instruction from memory. While that's happening, it's also adding to the PC so that the PC will contain the address of the next instruction. The instruction decode part is kind of hidden in this green box. It tells the registers which ones will be used, and it'll figure out what operation the ALU should do when the instruction gets to the execute phase. The store part is really a memory access part. While this is where we store data into memory, it's also where we read from memory. That means that one instruction can either read or write, but it can't do both. In addition, if we're reading data in, it will go through write back to be put into the CPU's registers. So now that we see the big picture, there's one important detail that we need to notice. There is a whole section of this that is just for calculating the next value of the program counter. This adder's sole purpose is to increment the program counter to get it ready for the next time we go through this cycle. The results of that addition get forwarded through the other phases until the memory access phase. Then it goes into a block that is a multiplexer. That's a big word for circuitry that picks one of its inputs as its output. You can see that in this case, it has two inputs and one control line. In these kind of diagrams, Control lines generally enter the block vertically, and inputs and outputs are horizontal. One input comes from the adder that incremented the program counter. The other comes from the output of the execute phase. The reason we need that multiplexer is because there is a chance that the instruction was some sort of jump or branch instruction. In that case, the instructor decoder will pull the address that we're supposed to jump to out and pass it forward. And then the execute stage will pass it forward. And that's the other input to the multiplexer. 
the instruction decoder will also pass forward a control line telling the multiplexer which new PC to pick. When the CPU is designed in sequential phases, it can actually be working on multiple instructions at once in a way that is called pipelining. One instruction gets read from memory in the fetch phase. That instruction moves to the decode phase and the fetch phase starts to read the next instruction. When that's finished, everything moves forward and the fetch of the third instruction starts, and so on. Having multiple instructions in different parts of the CPU is called pipelining. In order to play with the pipeline a little bit more, let's make a simplified drawing. In this drawing, the phases of the fetch, decode, execute, store cycle are the columns, and time goes downward. We start with one instruction in the fetch phase. When it moves to the decode phase, the fetch phase starts to fetch the next instruction. When those move to their next phases, fetch goes ahead and starts getting the next one. After enough instructions, all of the stages are busy. We call this the pipeline is full. When this happens, we're utilizing all of the CPU. Notice that we're completing one instruction every phase, even though it takes five times that long to complete a single instruction. We definitely want to keep that pipeline full. But now, let's look at what happens if we have a conditional jump or branch instruction. This code is just a series of statements. I don't really care what they are, except that statement X is a conditional jump. Let's look what happens at that conditional jump. As we execute this code, the pipeline fills and everything runs smoothly until statement X gets to the memory access phase. Remember, that's the phase that had the multiplexer that's choosing which value will be used for the next PC. Right. Suppose the condition says that we don't take the conditional jump. Then the next statement we should execute is S5, and that's the next thing in the pipeline. So not taking the conditional jump doesn't hurt the pipeline at all. Now suppose that the condition says we're supposed to make that jump then the next statement that we need to execute isn't the S5 that's in the pipeline. It's S10, which we haven't even started. Everything that is in the pipeline has to be thrown away. That's called flushing the pipeline, and it causes a pretty big disruption in execution. Now we're going to have to wait for the pipeline to refill before we start getting an instruction every cycle again. Since flushing the pipeline is so expensive, CPUs are designed to try to help make that not happen. The first thing they do is to change the behavior for unconditional jumps. These are jumps that we always take. Essentially, they add another path here that has another multiplexer to feed forward the address from a plain jump instruction back to the PC. That lets us only flush one phase instead of all four. Some processors take that idea even further. For conditional jumps, they will try to predict whether the jump is going to happen or not in that instruction decode phase. They keep a history of whether that instruction's jump has been taken and use that history to make a best guess. If the prediction is right, then we only flush at most one cycle. If it's wrong, we'll have to flush the whole thing, but we might have had to do that anyway. To see an example of why all of this matters, let's look at how if-then-else statements get translated into machine language. Notice that if the condition is true and we execute the stuff in the then block, the conditional jump is never taken, and the jump that we do take is not conditional. That means that the pipeline will never be flushed. However, if the condition is false and we need to execute the else block, then the conditional jump will be taken and the pipeline will get flushed. So, if we know that one of these actions, either the then block or the else block, happens more often than the other, we should structure our code to put the more common action in the then block because that will make the pipeline get flushed less often. This video has a really high level view of how a pipeline CPU works. In real CPUs, there are more stages and lots more details and challenges with pipelining. However, 
This level of detail is enough to show how the code that we write can affect the efficiency of the pipeline. Structuring our code so that we use jumps instead of conditional jumps can help.